Dr. Nathan Mitchell today from the political science department. Uh, he's going to be taking us on a, a short virtual tour of Spain. Uh, I believe he actually studied abroad there himself. And so I'll uh, get some firsthand experience from uh, Dr. Mitchell today. And with that, I'll let you take it away, sir. Um, can you give me host or uh, welcome me to share? Yes, no problem. Okay. If y'all can help me with this, let me know. So how would I do that? If you go to the green button where it says share screen, you can say share uh, multiple participants or whatever. Okay, there we go. Let me make sure this. All right. I hope I got everything. Can y'all see my screen? Yes. Okay. So thank you uh, for inviting me to talk about my experience in Spain. Uh, last time I was in Spain was, I think, 1990. 7, 1998. Uh, it was right before I went into senior year of high school or junior senior year of high school. Um, I was able to go with a company called AIFS um, and I actually went to college while I was in Spain. Um, the area that I studied in was Salamanca, Spain, which is in Castile and Leon or Castilla y Leon. It's one of the biggest states in, the, in Spain. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience, uh, life-changing. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful country and wonderful people. And I hope to give you a little bit of flavor of that today. Um, so one of the cool things about Spain is that it's really a amalgamation of three different cultures, really four different cultures, um, because it's got that Mediterranean influence as an uh, influence from the Moors when they invaded uh, Spain from uh, Africa and Morocco. Um, and then it's also got that Catholic European influence. And then um, I actually uh, was a Latin person in high school. And so going to uh, Spain allowed me to see the aqueducts and some Roman fortifications and things like that. There's a quote about Spain that said that the dead are almost alive in Spain because history's just everywhere. I mean, when, when we're talking about history here, I mean, it goes back thousands and thousands of years where our own country is just over a little over 250 years old. So um, uh, some of the places I'm uh, showing you I've actually been to. Uh, I stayed in the northern part of Spain for my six weeks while I was there. Um, but uh, I'm going to try to talk a little bit more about the Moors as well. So this is Alhambra. This is in Granada. Granada was the last capital of the Moors um, before uh, they were kicked out of the country. Um, they left the country in 1492. The Moors were uh, in control for almost 800 years. Um, they started conquests around 780, 790 uh, AD, and then they just sort of uh, kept a hold of the country. Um, the Plaza Mayor in Salamanca, the, the cool thing about most of the major cities in Spain is that they have a central gathering place. Uh, the main plaza is where everybody uh, gathers to shop. That's where they gather to hang out. They have festivals there. Um, one interesting thing that I'll talk a little bit more about later is while I was there, there was actually a terrorist attack in the northern part of Spain and somebody died. And so uh, the entire city got into this, this square to kind of mourn what had happened. Um, the other cool thing is like each of these uh, arches, there's shops around here. So this was like the best place to go get gelato after, after dinner. Um, Salamanca was uh, a pretty rich city because it actually had two cathedrals. So you had an older cathedral that was actually somewhat Romanized. And then you had the more medieval um, cathedral that was there. Uh, behind it, you can't totally see the, the gardens, but my favorite place to study was right behind the cathedral. They had a massive gardens that you could go walk to. 
And then talking about the Roman influence, you had the aqueducts in Segovia. Segovia was one of the last Roman fortifications in the, in the entire country, and the aqueduct was actually used up until the Middle Ages to bring water in from the mountains so that the town had uh, water to actually live in. Um, and so the Romans came to Spain in about 200 AD, 218 AD, and then they stayed until, sorry, BC, 218 BC until about 1980. Um, they brought roads, they brought aqueducts, they brought a lot of infrastructure, and a lot of this is still there. And the city where I stayed in Salamanca, um, the Roman bridge is still in operation. They just have basically gone in and, you know, cleaned it up and, um, you know, kept ma maintaining it. Um, the university where I went to, the University of Salamanca, um, was established in, uh, like, 1100. Um, and then it, it was in continuous operation. Y'all, it was almost like going to Hogwarts. Um, you know, everything is so old. The facades are really cool. You know, the classrooms are modern. You know, so they've gone back in and, you know, put in the correct, te you know, technology and things of that nature. But um, it was pretty neat. On the facade here, um, they, uh, they have little things all around the, the doors. And so you have to find something called Lorana. Lorana is a frog. And if you find the frog on the, uh, the face of the, uh, the building, you have good luck while you were there. Luckily, I found the frog. And so I had a very good trip while I was there. Um, while I'm talking about it, uh, class in Spain was a lot different. So if any of you decide to go study abroad, particularly with the program where I was, uh, they didn't speak English. And so, um, in fact, our, our uh, Spanish uh, teacher got really mad at us because we kept asking her to, you know, speak in, you know, English. She said, I don't want to speak in English. That's not my language. But uh, she was very cool and very understanding and an excellent teacher. Um, by the way, I went to Spain and I was, like I said, I didn't take any Spanish. I had to kind of learn it along the way. Um, the Catholic Church was incredibly important throughout uh, the history of Spain. Uh, even, even today, I'm sure most of you remember your history from, you know, American and Texas government where, you know, Spain had such a massive empire. But the church um, actually funded a lot of the government. So at one point, because the church had more lands than the, um, the actual government of Spain, 20% of the income came from the church. So there's always been a really tight relationship. And because of that, the Spanish government has really been very conservative. So up until the 1980s, you couldn't really even have a divorce in Spain. I mean, we kind of think about, you know, that's kind of, that's very prevalent here, but it was outlawed in, in, in Spain. All right, the other picture that I didn't talk about was, uh, Segovia Castle, or Alcazar de Segovia. Um, it was a renovated Roman fort and became the favored castle or palace of Isabella I. Now, if you remember your history, Isabella and Ferdinand were the people who sent Columbus to the United States. So um, this, was, this was where they, they ended up living. Um, Isabella was a queen in her own right, and then Ferdinand was uh, her husband. So she was the one that actually had the uh, the power, which was kind of interesting. Um, it was a beautiful, it's just a beautiful town, the Segovia. Um, the Moors brought a lot of different things to Spain. Uh, most of it was architectural, but you also had food and um, pottery, poetry, spices, um, any sort of color that you see really comes from the Moorish influence. Having outside gardens was something that they really uh, brought to uh, Spain. The language changed. Um, at one point during the, their occupation, 70% of the country was uh, Muslim. They had all converted except for the very northern parts of the, the, the Spanish uh, country. Um, in 1200, the northern country, the northern uh, city states, or um, at that point kingdoms, decided that they were going to reconquer the, the Spanish uh, mainland. So uh, the Reconquista started by uh, Alfonso VIII, and he 
basically and his successors went to try to reconquer the rest of the country. And this ended in 1491. Uh, and then by 1492, the Moors had withdrawn from uh, Africa. Some of that had to do with the Spanish Inquisition. Um, they came in and tried to convert all the um, Muslims and Jews to Catholicism by force. And if you didn't convert, you basically were removed from the country. But uh, it was very interesting. Um, I didn't go to the, the southern part of the, the Spain. That's where the Moorish influence is the, the greatest. But uh, Sevilla and Granada and Barcelona are probably the most beautiful areas. And if I ever get a chance to go back, I want to go back. Uh, this is the Grand Mosque uh, in Cordova. Um, what's interesting about this is that it's now a cathedral. So they took the mosque and they basically went in and basically got rid of a lot of the Moorish influence and converted it to a, um, a, a cathedral. So you can still go in and see a lot of the arches and things and uh, see this is ma major architecture, but you know, they tried to quote unquote sanitize you know, a lot of the areas. Um, but it's a very interesting uh, area. Um, culture. So, uh, some things that uh, are really unique is that each area of Spain has almost its unique culture because the the provinces were given so much authority. A lot of it's because their 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 cultures or subcultures are so different from each other. Um, in the northern part of Spain, agriculture is still very important, even though the cities are you know pretty advanced. Um, so. Uh, paella is a specific food that is just awesome in Spain. It's really a seafood, a rice dish, but uh, it changes to where you were. So when I was in Spain, the area where I lived was a lot of pork and chicken. And so the paella had a little bit of seafood, but it was really pork and chicken. But if you could go down south where seafood is more prevalent, it's all seafood. Um, Dance is important. So Salamanca has a regional dance and they do it every Saturday night. So the uh, public goes out and they dance and they participate. Um, and we went out and tried to dance with them, but they didn't like that. They said the Americans were culturally appropriating their stuff. Uh, but it was nice to at least be there and, and, and view the culture and talk to the people and just everybody was having a really good time. Um, the running of the bulls is really an important thing in Spain. On the one hand, you can kind of think of it as you know, uh, somewhat cruelty to animals because uh, you know, sometimes the bulls get hurt or people really get hurt. But where it came about is uh, basically this was the time of the year where they used to move the cattle uh, from the, um, uh, the outskirts where they were grazing and move them into the city so that they can be sold. And slowly, it, the festival, festival of San, I can't remember the name, but the Running of the Bulls Festival in Pamplona became a much more bigger thing about your bravado and being a man and things of that nature. I had two students go while they were studying abroad in Spain, and they actually got to go run in the bulls and they made it into the arena, which was kind of interesting. If you ever get a chance, check it out. Um, while I was there, uh, every morning during the, it was a whole week of festivities. Every morning while I was there, they showed it on the news. So it's like a really big deal where you're watching it like CNN style, what's happening. Um, as mentioned, while I was also there, they had a, um, a terrorist attack by a group called the ETA or ETA. And uh, they ended up canceling the running of the bulls because of safety concerns. So they only got about half a week. Um, another interesting thing is uh, this idea of siesta. Um, siesta is a big thing, particularly in the northern part of the, the, this, the country. So uh, we would go to class in the morning and then they would release us for lunch. And then we'd have to go back uh, by four o'clock, I think, three or four o'clock to finish out the day. But you had to rush because the entire city shut down. Um, when I looked a little bit more recently, um, siesta is kind of going away because of economic issues. Unemployment in Spain is around uh, 18 to 20% right now. And so people are trying to go that extra mile 
to uh, show that they're present. That's that uh, idea of present, presentimo, where you're at work, you're doing your job, you're going above and beyond so that people would want to keep you. Other places in Spain are trying to, you know, make sure that this break in the day is still there. Um, but I just want to tell you, this siesta thing, this break in the day was great, at least in terms for those of us going to school. Um, but the Spanish people party until midnight. Like when you're there, you know, it's, a, you know, dinner is like at nine o'clock and that's like a little snack. And then you go, you go play for the rest of the night. They, um, uh, it's just a very interesting experience. The biggest meal of the day is lunch. Um, so you have a really big meal, you have a sort of a nap to finish it off and then you go back to work or school. But, you know, it's just a very interesting thing where just everything shut down. Um, so I'm a big dude and food is really important to me. Um, and the food in Spain is absolutely amazing. Um, one of the interesting things is tapas. Um, the tapas, it's basically this idea that you want to always kind of be in the moment. And so you have small bites of food that you can enjoy in between, you know, con conversing with friends and things of that nature. But it's really well seasoned. It's very flavorful. And it's, you know, you're trying to enjoy what you're, with what you're doing right there. Um, tapas are a lifestyle there where you go and you have multiple rounds of smaller dishes. Um, sangria. So it's not the way that we think of it here in the United States where you just go buy a bottle of it if that is what you want to do. This is really, uh, every area has their own recipe. So when I stayed in Spain because I was younger, I didn't stay with the home family. I stayed at uh, the dormitory of the college that was attached to kind of a monastery. Um, and uh, the priest who was running the, the dorm was, um, he had his own recipe. So when we left, by the way, I was a good boy. Uh, even though I could drink in Spain at the time, I uh, held by American rules. But he made us his own special sangria recipe that, you know, it's own, his secret recipe that had been passed down from head priest to head priest to head priest. So this was like an ancient recipe that they had, you know, kept together. But um, it's a, it's a, that's another sort of lifestyle type of thing. And the paella is really excellent. Everywhere you go is excellent. Uh, this, the, this, the rice is well seasoned. The meat is really good. The seafood is good. And then the one thing that sort of changed my life was hard bread. So um, they have bakeries everywhere. And you could go get the best bread daily. And by the way, you know how we go and we tend to buy groceries for um, uh, the week or the month? They don't do that. They go and buy fresh food for the meal. So on your way home, you may stop off at the market or the grocery store. They have grocery stores or stop off at a vendor and pick up your food and fresh vegetables. And then that's how you would cook your meal for the day. And by the way, um, the walking again was great. I think while I was there, I lost about 30 pounds because you're just walking. You walk everywhere. You're eating really rich food and you're just, you know, you're exercising a lot more. It's much healthier. Politics. So, um, this is uh, King Philip and Queen Leticia. Um, Spain has a constitutional monarchy, but it's more parliamentary. So they're very similar to the way England operates. So they have a president of the assembly, which is basically like a prime minister that makes all of the major decisions. That person is elected. Um, the current king is the head of state, which means that he's the chief diplomat. He, he's the symbol of the country and he's over the armed forces. Um, his father was put into place by Franco. Franco was a dictator or a fascist uh, that had ruled Spain for about 30 years. Um, and uh, when they knew that Franco was going to die, his father was placed on the throne, on the throne. and his father was the first person to move the country back towards democracy. So away from the dictator, away from the, um, uh, authoritarian and towards more democratic rule. 
um, the most recent constitution is 1978. And in that uh, part of the um, uh, negotiation is that they made it so that the provinces were almost autonomous. So like the states were more important because Franco had basically beat up all the different regions. So they wanted to give the provinces a lot more authority. So um, currently the heir to the throne is his daughter. So she will be queen when uh, he is, um, uh, when he passes. So uh, just like most monarchies, power is uh, transferred and uh, hereditary. So his daughter will um, take over for him. He's very popular right now in most areas of the state. Um, so I thought what would be very interesting to kind of end with is since we're dealing with um, a lot of protests and things uh, in our country to kind of compare what's going on in Spain. So um, when I was there, like I said, in two, uh, 20, 1997, um, there was a terrorist attack by the group ADA in the Basque region. Uh, they have basically wanted to, uh, uh, not sure why those other things are there, but that's okay. They have basically want to be separate from the rest of the country because they're just a different region and they want it to be their own. They actually identify more with France than they do with Spain. And uh, they thought that the Spanish government, particularly under Franco, was very oppressive and they just wanted to move. So from the 1950s up until really 2011, uh, they had been pushing, uh, sometimes violently, to leave the, to leave the, the nation. Um, they have fixed this. So uh, basically, they had some peace accords very similar to what happened in Ireland. And uh, the, the government has negotiated uh, the Bosque area to stay. More recently, though, um, the Catalan region has tried to leave the country as well. Um, Ca Ca Catalonia is where Barcelona is. And this is the economic powerhouse for the entire country. Um, most uh, Western country, uh, banks and corporations have headquarters in Barcelona. And because of that, uh, this region uh, makes up 20% of the GDP for the entire country. And what happened during the 2008-2009 Great Recession is that Spain uh, got in trouble financially. And they started raising taxes, having more regulations, and uh, the, the Catalonians really just didn't want to pay for that, what they thought were bad practices in the rest of the country. And so they're still actually fighting this. They had a referendum where they elected a president and a new parliament. Uh, Madrid came back and actually dissolved their parliament and invalidated the referendum. So they're still having a battle now about what to do with Catalonia. My guess is that they're gonna still stay in the region, but that's still an, that's still an issue. Another issue is Spain's relationship with Morocco. Right now, there are two what they call independent cities that are in Morocco that are under Spanish control. Morocco would like to have them back, uh, but many of them are Spanish, they're, they're Spanish citizens. And so um, there's a question of what would happen to those, to those people if Morocco took control. So um, they're still trying to you know, deal with that right now. Um, so I wanted to also talk a little bit about the company that I went with. So um, my, my circumstances for study abroad were very different than many of you would have to deal with because uh, I was 16, uh, going on 17, and uh, I basically I needed a different experience to go. Um, I did not stay with a family. That's always an option, and my peers that had that experience loved it. They loved their Spanish mothers. Um, they had the best food and the best experiences. But I had a great experience too. Um, there was a lady that kind of ran the day shift at the dorm and she would always come check on me because I was her little baby, right? So she wanted to make sure that I, you know, every, everything was taken care of. Um, the cost back then was reasonable, it was about $2,500 because I'm just, I'm here to tell you we was po. Um, and uh, to scrape it together this amount of money to go was a lot. Um, but, you know, I had grandparents and parents and aunts and uncles when I had the opportunity presented to me and we made it happen. 
uh, that's kind of what happens is that your family just helps. What I liked about this company is that everything was included. So you had your food, housing, and tuition, and you, they have a lot of different options. But the best part about the trip, other than me being able to experience something and my, my life just changed, was uh, the language. By the end of the trip, uh, like I said, I was a Latin person. I could get around Madrid by myself. So um, just about three or four weeks of just total immersion uh, into this culture and the language, I was able to converse, I was able to get around and not be a stupid American. So it was an excellent, excellent trip. Um, if you're able to go to Spain, I highly suggest you do it. When I was preparing for this, I, I just started kind of bawling because I was like, I want to go back because it was just an amazing, amazing trip. All right, I look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you, Nathan, for your presentation. It was good to see how your journey was in Spain. Anybody have any questions for him? Um, I have any questions. Oh, sorry. Okay. I have a question um, about the, the beautiful alcoholic beverage that I saw there. <laughs> it looked like there were apples in that, but could you tell us what those fruits were that was, uh, that was in the, the drink? So it depends on where you are. Uh, each sangria recipe is different. So apples, melons, fresh fruit, strawberries, different spices, um, cinnamon sometimes. It just depends on where you are and how they put it together. Um, but uh, it was excellent. I mean, I, I didn't try it. But I'm sorry. Nice. You didn't try it at all. Not I was 16. I, I, I didn't feel good doing that. Um, you, was, you was good. That's a part of the cultural experience. Yeah, and especially if the priest made it up. Mm -hmm. So it's holy. It was holy. <laughs> Anybody have any more questions? The other, comments? Thing, the other thing that's very cool is that um, almost every major house or, or building had like a courtyard. So nature was always there. And so you could just ex be out there and experience. Uh, last little thing, and this is this, this I'm sure I'll have others, but uh, pedestrians do not have the right of way in Spain. Mm -hmm. So um, because their roads are really built uh, for smaller cars or maybe one way, originally their roads were built for like donkeys and carriages and horses and stuff, right? Because the cities are that old. So when they put the pavement in, um, they didn't really make provisions for things like um, uh, sidewalks. So we were walking home from the main plaza one night and this car just came up behind us and we just started looking and he just parked on the sidewalk right behind us, tried to hit us. So just be very careful. You gotta be and on your Thank you in Spain. All right, y'all. So we're a little bit over 3.30. So I'm gonna take one more question. Well, I didn't have a question. I just also wanted to thank Dr. Mitchell. It was short, but I learned so much and I'm, I'm honestly so what I want to go. I will, uh, I can send you the, uh, the presentation too, if you want to see it. Please do, please yes, do. Yes, please. We were talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll send it to Stephanie and she can yeah. send it to her. Yes, yeah, send it to me, um, Nathan, and we'll make sure that they get it. And uh, mm -hmm. Ms. Harris, I'll see if I can find a sangria recipe from mm -hmm. the guy if he's posted it. All right, Nathan, thank you for this information. Like everyone said, it was informative, short, but very informative. And it uh, seemed like you had a really good time there. And Spain looks incredibly beautiful. Now, the other thing I want you to kind of know is that I went before Spain became part of the Eurozone. And so mm -hmm. the exchange rate was awesome. That was part of the reason why I was able to do so much and us being financially strapped. A little bit went a long way. Now they're with the Euro, so the exchange rate is not as good. But it's still a wonderful place, and I hope you all get to go. They're wonderful people, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you. So our next, um, our next country tour will be on July 6th. Stay tuned to where we'll be touring next. Right, thank y'all. All right, everyone take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.